Major funding for NJ Spotlight News is provided in part by NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association, and by the PSCG Foundation. Tonight on NJ Spotlight News, the sports world is in mourning after NHL player and Jersey native Johnny Gaudreau and his brother are tragically killed by an alleged drunk driver in South Jersey. Plus, ahead of International Overdose Awareness Day, New Jersey advocates unveil a roadmap for saving lives, leveraging opioid settlement funds to drive change. What is working well is a residential addiction treatment, outpatient addiction treatment, evidence-based prevention services, harm reduction services. Also, the Garden State prepares for Labor Day weekend as a record-breaking number of travelers are set to hit the roads and skies. I think some of the people that may have put off going to the shore uh, much of the summer for financial reasons are realizing this is the last chance. And after a week of political jockeying, State Senator Nellie Poe officially secures the Democratic nomination to replace the late Congressman Bill Pascrell. I am so honored and privileged and, and just so proud and when, to become the first Latina in the history of the state of New Jersey to go to Congress. NJ Spotlight News begins right now. From NJ PBS Studios, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venozzi. Good evening and thanks for joining us this Friday night. I'm Brianna Venozzi. We begin with a few key stories we're following. A tragedy in South Jersey is sending shockwaves throughout the state and NHL hockey world. Columbus Blue Jackets star Johnny Gaudreau and his younger brother were killed Thursday night after being struck by an alleged drunk driver while riding bikes near their Salem County home. The 31-year-old Goudreau, who's better known as Johnny Hockey to fans, and his 29-year-old brother Matthew, who was a hockey star in his own right, were killed on a highway near their family home in Carney's Point. Authorities say a man driving an SUV tried to pass two other cars and struck the brothers from behind. The brothers were in town to be groomsmen in their sister's wedding, which was scheduled for today. Johnny Goudreau was a star at Gloucester Catholic High School and Boston College before being drafted in 2011 by the Calgary Flames. He played 11 professional seasons in the NHL, most recently with the Blue Jackets. The New Jersey Devils and Blue Jackets today issued statements saying in part they're shocked and devastated by this unimaginable tragedy, adding Johnny played the game with great joy felt by everyone who watched him on the ice. Now, it's been a dangerous year on New Jersey's roads. According to state police statistics, there have been 402 fatal crashes and 424 fatalities so far. That's a 14 percent jump from last year. Also tonight, Garden State officials are calling on the federal government to create new protections from forever chemicals polluting the air. The New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection, along with counterparts in North Carolina and New Mexico, petitioned the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency on Thursday to list four chemicals as hazardous under the Federal Clean Air Act. Those chemicals, PFOA, PFOS, PFNA, and Gen X, are among the most common members of the PFAS family. They've long been used in all sorts of products, but the same properties that make the chemicals useful to industry also make them impossible to break down naturally. PFAS have been linked to serious health effects in humans. State leaders have for years tried to address PFAS pollution, which is widespread here. Dozens of drinking water systems around the state have been found to have high levels of the chemicals in recent years. Air pollution, particularly from industrial facilities that use PFAS, is known to be a source of the problem in New Jersey. 
And if you struggled through the heat this summer, you weren't alone. It was one for the books. Scientists say the U.S. and world are on track for the most humid summer season on record. That's based on 85 years of record keeping and measuring dew points. Climate experts tell The Washington Post models have long predicted that human caused global warming would lead to higher humidity because warmer air evaporates more water from the Earth's surface and can hold more moisture. It makes sense. But but the consequences can be severe. More humidity puts greater stress on the body and increases the odds of more extreme rainfall and flooding, and of course creates a greater demand for cooling options like air conditioning. The sweltering conditions made it downright dangerous in some areas where the summer just felt relentless, increasing the risk of heat-related illnesses and even death. The Biden administration today opened public comment on proposed rules to protect workers from heat. And if the heat trend holds, five of the most humid summers in both the U.S. and on the planet will have occurred since just 1998. The heat is an extra reason for residents to head to the shore this holiday weekend. Both AAA and the Port Authority expect record travel on the roads, on the rails, and in the air. Economists expect the weekend to provide a big boost for businesses up and down the state, not just the shore. Ted Goldberg spoke to tourism officials about the success of this summer season and what to expect if you're heading out this weekend. While summer technically goes for another three weeks, most of us consider this weekend the last of the summer season. Travel and economic experts expect it to be a busy one in New Jersey. I think some of the people that may have put off going to the shore uh, much of the summer for financial reasons are realizing this is the last chance. We have seen increases across the board. So people that are staying locally understandably because of the start of the school year, you know, they're just looking to get the last long weekend. So we are seeing drive trips increase. AAA is estimating a 9% increase in travel bookings from last year's record setting year. Tracy Noble says more people want to get out and drive or fly in some cases. What we're seeing is that people want experiences. So they are not putting as much stock as they did in necessarily material items, but they want to go and have these experiences, which is why we're seeing increases in not only domestic bookings, but in international bookings. The total numbers aren't in yet for shore communities, but Ben Rose says it was a pretty good summer for the Wildwoods, which got a big boost from big events like the Trump rally in May. I think a lot of new people got introduced to the Wildwoods that have never been here before. More importantly, the Barefoot Country Music Fest uh, actually sold out this year, and there were about 40,000 tickets sold for each of the four days. So that's a huge influx of people in June really kicking off uh, our summer business. A good summer for the Wildwoods, but not a great one as South Jersey shore communities dealt with a slew of obstacles. I think that could be attributed to uh, the, the high airport uh, volume and people flying overseas for vacations. There's a, a, a huge increase in flying to Europe right now. Boardwalk merchants were very upset by the lack of uh, big events that would draw people to the boardwalk and um, help their business. The air show, which brings in up to a half a million people, for some reason that, that didn't occur this year and it's been going on for I don't know, decades. Stockton professor Michael Bustler says the summer was mixed for Atlantic City. Casinos made a little more money, mostly from online gambling. While inflation played a role, it has cooled off a bit over the last couple of years. So once prices go up, they're now not going up quite as fast. So you don't have to get as much of a price increase, but still those commodity prices, labor prices, Energy prices were up significantly in Atlanta County, where I live. If you don't feel like fighting through all of this traffic to get one last gasp of summer, you could always head down the shore later on. There's never a bad time to go to the beach in Jersey. Temperatures are still nice and mild. Ocean temperatures are the warmest they've been all summer. Uh, there's um, reduced rates in all the accommodations, so you can get uh, great uh, hotel rates and uh, no lines in restaurants. As soon as kids go back to school, nobody's pulling them out to go 
you know, on vacation. So it's the best time to experience things uh, where the weather is still great and significantly less crowds. That's still off in the future. In the meantime, there's slight relief in North Jersey from the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. They're pausing repairs and construction at their crossings through the weekend while anticipating nearly 7 million people to pass through them. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Ted Goldberg. State Senator Nellie Poe Thursday night officially secured the Democratic nomination to replace the late Congressman Bill Pascrell in a fast-tracked process that gave the party just eight days to pick a successor before ballots go to print for the November election. Poe was the sole candidate and got a unanimous vote at the special county convention held in Wayne. 464 committee members from Bergen, Passaic, and Hudson counties voted in favor of her nomination. Following the endorsement Endorsements of party power brokers throughout the 9th Congressional District, Governor Murphy, and even Pascrell's family. That led Poe's competitors to drop out of the race one by one this week. Patterson Mayor Andre Saya and Assembly members Shavonda Sumter and Benji Wimberly all tossed their hat in the ring but didn't get the support. Senior political correspondent David Cruz breaks down the nomination process and what's next in the District 9 race. <music> In a year where the succession process has been more in focus than probably ever before, the race to succeed the late Congressman Bill Pascrell on the Democratic ballot for the fall ended before it even really began. In just a few days' time, only one of the four candidates was left standing. I give you now Senator Nellie Paul, our nominee. You know, you're a very humble person, but this is like a big... As, as Joe Biden once said to Barack Obama, this is a big effing deal. Yeah, well, it is a big deal. I am so honored and privileged and, and just so proud and when to become the first Latina in the history of the state of New Jersey to go to Congress. But Poe's successful campaign, as it were, brought the succession process into focus again. State law says committee members vote to make the pick. But in reality, only the three guys, the county chairs in Hudson, Bergen, and Passaic counties, have to agree on a candidate. In Poe's case, Bergen's backing was critical, and it brought along Hudson and Passaic quickly, which led to this week's pro forma exercise. May I have a vote? But an acclamation vote is not exactly a secret vote, even with just one candidate to choose from. And critics, including Hanel Patel of the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice, say a secret vote is the minimum level of democratic process voters should be entitled to, even given the tight time constraints in this case. In terms of this existing system, yes, I think it's fair to go, hey, you put, you should have at least an expectation, if not a change in law, an expectation to go, hey, you um, should have a anonymous vote, a ballot, a secret ballot, a one of those fundamental parts of democracy, the whole idea of a secret ballot. Do that. Let candidates come and make their case um, instead of having a process where everyone watches how heavy handed party bosses are and then just has to live with it. Billy Prempa, the Republican who will face off against Poe in this blue district, says Poe is what happens when the party chairs call the shots. She's not the most qualified uh, compared to the other candidates. If they believe that she's the one, then I want her to get on the debate stage because I think the people deserve the right to know what this candidate actually stands for, especially since they've been isolated for so long. Nellie Poe would appear to be the favorite in November. Pascrell won this district by 12 percentage points in 2022. The next question, of course, is who will succeed Poe in the state Senate? The same potential candidates for Pascrell's seat will likely put their names up for that process, which includes a convention of committee members in the 35th legislative district. The maneuvering for that seat has already begun. For Democrats today, they seem to be okay to have arrived at a solid blue vote like Nellie Poe, with just maybe a touch of uneasiness about how they got here. I'm David Cruz, NJ Spotlight News. 
As it's been noted, Democrats could potentially make history now if Poe defeats the Republican challenger Billy Prempa this fall. She'll be the first Latina to represent New Jersey in Congress. Coincidentally, Poe got her start in politics when she was appointed in 1997 to fill a seat in the state assembly, vacated when Pascrell was first elected to Congress. Poe held the seat until 2012 when she moved up to the Senate and has won four re-elections since then. State Senator Nellie Poe joins me now. Senator, first of all, congratulations. Uh, I'm sure it's been a whirlwind process. And given the short runway to the election, does that mean that campaigning starts today? It certainly does. It does start today. Actually, um, let me just say that um, we're ready and we're ready to run. I want to mention that, you know, this week obviously um, has been mixed with emotion, both heavy and grief, and with but at the same time, full of hope. The passing of my dear friend and mentor, Bill Pascrell, has certainly left an impact to all of us. He was our beloved, uh, sir, he was a beloved servant, someone who truly was known all throughout his uh, uh, congressional district, but all throughout the, the the state and the nation because his voice was loud and was heard loud and clear. He was a true fighter, someone who I absolutely highly respected. So it comes with that mixed emotion. I'm sure it must feel surreal that it was almost 30 years ago when you filled his uh, state legislative seat. Now here you are potentially going to fill his congressional seat. Uh, we've all talked about how he was a fighter. You know, he didn't mince words. So how do you plan to take uh, all of the mentorship that I know that he gave to you into not just running, but if you are elected? Well, you know, I, I, um, I, we all know how Bill roared and how big of a person he was in terms of making sure that his voice was heard. I will be working equally as hard if, um, and I probably would say that I would have to work even harder because I know that I need to begin uh, establishing the groundwork from day one. I'm prepared to do that. I feel that I'm uh, my all my years in service uh, has allowed to prepare me for this next step. And I, so, Senator, what's at the top then of your priority list um, for the issues that you're going to focus on in the state? You've done a lot with uh, your seat in the Judiciary Committee criminal justice, juvenile justice reform. What do you see then as the top issues for your district uh, on the federal level? I would say that some of the uh, issues that are important to us on a federal level are very much the same kind of issues that we see day to day. It's all about making sure that we build upon our infrastructure. It's about making sure that we address some of the economic needs that are important to our entire district. It's important that we have the proper access and accessibility to health care, building upon making uh, our educational system greater and, and able to to ensure that those resources are available for uh, our, my district. Very quickly, you mentioned that you plan to build upon the foundation that the late congressman laid. Uh, where do you stand? Is there any discrepancy in your stance about sending military aid to allies like Israel, um, those in the district in Patterson? There was, of course, some conflict given the makeup of the district, um, having a large Arab American, Palestinian American population. Would you say you stand uh, with the late congressman uh, in a similar stance? I do believe that um, it's important for us to continue the, the work of making sure to protect, to support our allies. And I am, I'm a, I strongly believe that that's something that we need to, to continue to do. But with respect to your question about setting limitations or so forth, uh, my position would be similar to that of um, our late congressman, making sure that we provide the necessary resources to um, our uh, all of our allies, and certainly um, uh, we know that that would be important. Setting limitations at this time would not be the thing to do, and I would be um, looking to um, continue that effort.
State Senator and now Democratic Congressional nominee Nellie Poe, thanks so much for your time. Thank you, Brianna. Well, Saturday marks International Overdose Awareness Day, the world's largest annual campaign to end overdose, remember those who've died, and remind the public that there is hope. There are a number of local events being sponsored around the state, from vigils to meetings and community outreach. According to the CDC, 2,600 people in New Jersey lost their lives to overdose last year. As senior correspondent Joanna Gagas reports, advocates are zeroing in on parts of the state that need more money to save more residents from this preventable death. Unfortunately, his drug that he chose was laced with fentanyl and he didn't stand a chance. You know, he was he was gone within seconds of the overdose. It's hard for Arlene Brogan to talk about her younger brother, Brian Brogan, who died of an overdose last year, relapsing after years of struggling with addiction. It broke our family in, uh, in half. Tomorrow, August 31st, is International Overdose Awareness Day. And with more than 2,500 New Jerseyans dying from an overdose in 2023 alone, recovery support groups are calling for change. Every overdose is preventable. Alyssa Tierney is with the Not One More campaign that's just released a second version of a roadmap for the state of New Jersey on how to spend the opioid settlement funds coming to the state from pharma companies responsible for flooding the marketplace with opioids. We would like to see these funds used for med medically assisted treatment, which would be buprenorphine and methadone, which are evidence-based practices, harm reduction centers, where people are coming in to get testing strips and syringes. New Jersey is expected to get about a billion dollars uh, between now and the year of 2038. Uh, that billion dollars is gonna be split in half. Half is gonna be distributed by the state and the other half is gonna be going to counties and cities uh, throughout the state of New Jersey. Bob Budsock leads Integrity House in Newark and agrees the funds should only go to programs that are proven to reduce overdose deaths. What is working well is a residential addiction treatment, outpatient addiction treatment, evidence-based prevention services, harm reduction services, and also ensuring that recovery supports are available. One of those key supports, housing. Safe, sober, uh, supportive recovery housing. So, you know, there are some housing opportunities for individuals, but not enough. The Not One More Roadmap also discourages any programs or systems that continue the war on drugs approach or criminalizing those who are battling addiction. Let's not try to like ticket and arrest our way out of this problem because it has never worked. Tierney says an innovative approach that's been successful in New York is overdose prevention centers where people can safely use inside rather than out on the street. They work. They take public use inside. So not only are you not you don't you're not getting arrested outside for using, you're bringing that in, but if you do overdose, there's someone there to reverse the overdose, but also connect you to care. A model that could have saved Brian Brogan's life, says Arlene. An addict walks into the hospital. What they did was they revived him with Narcan and they let him go a few hours later. And Ad, what, what the addicts will do is they'll go continue to use the drug. And that's what happened to my brother. He walked out of the hospital and died the night he was saved. So I would really, really like some of those funds to go to maybe meeting with ERs, talking to doctors. And creating procedures for immediate referrals to care. And it's these personal perspectives that Not One More believes should be part of the strategic planning for spending funds. They're asking the state to listen to them and target the money toward local organizations that are building relationships within the communities of those using drugs. We are guiding you in the the direction where the opioid settlement money should go. We're on the front lines. We are listening to the people who are struggling, the families, people who have, um, the families of the people who have died. And this is where they want the money to go. And this is like, it's based in evidence. It is more costly and time consuming. However, the most effective um, responses have been on a more local level. And that's where the community peer recovery centers and and having harm reduction centers in each county will be will be beneficial. And they'd like the council that makes the funding decisions to open its meetings to the public so they can weigh in on the billion dollar allocation. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Joanna Gagas. Turning to Wall Street, stocks climbed today after the latest reading on the Fed's inflation index. Here's how the trading day ended. 
finally tonight, a Jersey Shore landfill that closed decades ago is still getting hit with fines for pollution. State environment regulators issued a nearly $300,000 fine to the owners of the Aero Marine property in Keyport after recent inspections identified a number of violations, including that the landfill was never properly closed and that over the years, the owner of the site didn't take steps to make sure illegal dumping was occurring. The location was once home to an airplane hangar and has a history of environmental issues. After operating as a landfill, Aeromarine was used as an industrial park for businesses ranging from an auto mechanic to landscaping companies. The site is near the place where the baykeeper this summer discovered what appeared to be chunks of lead illegally dumped on a public beach that prompted this recent investigation. But Aeromarine hasn't been linked to the material. A state investigation is ongoing and earlier this month, the state geologist said that lead may have been naturally occurring. That's going to do it for us tonight. But before you go, a reminder to download the NJ Spotlight News podcast so you can listen to us anytime. I'm Brianna Venozzi for the entire team at NJ Spotlight News. Thanks for being with us. Have a great weekend. Be safe if you're traveling. We'll see you right back here on Monday. New Jersey Education Association making public schools great for every child, and RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. Our future relies on more than clean energy. Our future relies on empowered communities, the health and safety of our families and neighbors, of our schools and streets. The PSEG Foundation is committed to sustainability, equity, and economic empowerment. Investing in parks, helping towns go green, supporting civic centers, scholarships, and workforce development that strengthen our community.